Hello Internet. Welcome to the second part of our series on the free boson. I will put a link to the first part in the description below. Last time we defined the field phi and we said that in the framework of classical physics you can think of phi as a real valued function of space and time. We also demanded that our field be periodic in the space direction, which is equivalent to wrapping our space dimension into a compact circle. We gave the field some dynamics by, by postulating its Lagrangian density. And this Lagrangian density fixes the dynamics of the field, at least the classical dynamics, by the principle of stationary action. And by that, whenever we specify the field values at two points in time, t1 and t2, for all points in space, the principle of stationary action completely defines the evolution of the field values between these two times. From the Lagrangian density, we were also able to derive an equation of motion for the field that holds at all points in space and time. It is important to observe that this equation is a linear partial differential equation. The linearity of this equation in the field and its derivatives will turn out to be directly related to the fact that this is a theory of non-interacting particles. Having this equation of motion gives us a second view on the dynamics of the field. It turns out that using the theory of partial differential equations, one can show that a time slice like this, that is all the points in space at one particular time coordinate, forms a so-called Cauchy surface. A Cauchy surface is a surface such that specifying initial conditions for the field on this surface, which is in our case just this circle at a given constant time, gives a unique solution of this equation of motion, meaning that it fixes the time evolution of the field for all times. So what does such an initial condition consist of? In our case, as we have a second order partial differential equation for the field, the initial conditions consist in specifying the value of the field for all points x in space at time t1 and also specifying the value of the time derivative of the field for all points in space at the same time. So, to summarize, the specification of two functions, both periodic in space, as we defined here, completely fixes the evolution of the field values at all times by the, equations, by the equation of motion. So, in either case, Classical physics gives us a unique solution for the evolution of the field when we specify two periodic functions of space. Either we specify the field values at two different points in time and use the principle of stationary action, or we specify the field and its time derivative on a Cauchy surface and use the equation of motion. In the previous part, we motivated our expectation that wave-like field configurations would have particularly simple behavior with time. And this leads us to our next step, namely the expansion of our field in terms of its Fourier series. This will be a linear transformation to new variables with these names, and the field phi can be expressed in the terms of these new variables in the following way. Phi at x and t is equal to 
a naught at t time t so a naught is a function of t plus the sum running over all natural numbers k of a cosine k of t where this cosine is just part of the name of the new variable times cosine of k x 2 pi over l where l is the period we defined for our field plus a sine k of t again the sign just being part of the name times sine kx 2 pi over l with all this part being inside the sum over all natural numbers k note that these new variables uppercase a are not fields that is they do not depend on space and time like phi did they are ordinary dynamic variables that only depend on time in the classical framework this means they are simply functions from the real numbers to the real numbers how do we know that this expansion is actually going to work for all points x and t in space-time The crucial fact is that for any arbitrary but fixed time t, phi of x of t is a periodic function of x with period l. And in this case, the theory of Fourier series tells us that this series will actually converge to the original function phi, given that we define the uppercase a's as follows a0 of t must be 1 over l times the integral over dx from 0 to l of phi xt a cosine k of t shall be 2 over l times the integral from 0 to l dx over phi of x t times cosine of k x 2 pi over l and exactly the same for a sine of k just using the sine function here and these equations shall hold for all t in r and for all natural numbers k these new quantities uppercase a are called the Fourier coefficients or also the Fourier modes of the field because as we will soon see they correspond to well-behaved wave-like oscillations of the field however I want to emphasize that so far in defining these Fourier coefficients we have not yet used anything about the dynamics of the field in particular we did not need to use the equation of motion this is important because it means that this transformation of variables that we relies only on the spatial periodicity of our observables will also be applicable in the quantum mechanical framework. I also want to warn you that these uppercase a quantities are not yet the modes that will form the algebra presented by Michael in his video. If you look this material up in textbooks you can find much quicker and more elegant derivations that go quite directly to the algebra of modes but that's not what we are doing here here we will go very slowly and do things step by step to have the 
best possible understanding of what is going on. But let's now take a look at how the Fourier coefficients will behave dynamically in the framework of classical mechanics. In order to see that, we could directly plug this expansion of the field into the equation of motion, but it will be more useful to us uh, to first express the action in terms of our new variables. For that, we need to plug the field expansion into our Lagrangian density. And the first step in doing this is to express the partial derivatives of the field with respect to time and with respect to space in the new variables. So let's do that. Uh, first, we will write down the partial derivative of phi with respect to time. This is very simple because the only time dependence here is in these functions uppercase a. So taking the time derivative, we simply take the time derivative of each of these functions. And this being a linear transformation of variables. And we will denote the time derivative by putting a dot over the symbol. But this is just notation for, for example, a zero dot of t is simply d a zero by dt at time t and so on. So let's now look at the spatial derivative. This is slightly more work. The a quantities don't have any spatial dependence, so they will just act as constants now, but we do have spatial dependence inside the cosine and sine functions here. So the first thing we see is that the a naught term will completely drop out in the spatial derivative. So we only have sum over k going over the natural numbers. And for the first term, we get from the inner derivative here, we get a factor of k times 2 pi over l times a cosine k of t acting just like a constant. And then the cosine um, differentiates to minus the sine. So we get a minus sign here. And here we have the sine of kx 2 pi over l. Second term is quite similar. We get a constant factor of k over 2 pi, k times 2 pi over l times a sine k of t times cosine kx 2 pi over l. I cope it these expressions up here, and now the next step would be to plug them into the Lagrangian density. You can see that due to these squares here, if we do this directly, we will get quite a lengthy and messy expression containing lots of products of cosine and sine functions and so on. And you can do that, but actually it's not worth our time because recall that the Lagrangian density only enters the action by being integrated over space into the Lagrangian function. So we had these, this Lagrangian function L being defined as the integral from zero to L over dx 
of the Lagrangian density. And it turns out that uh, this integral over the whole of space will drastically simplify uh, this expression in terms of the new variables. Because actually most of the terms generated by these squares will drop out. They will vanish by being integrated from 0 to L. So what do we get in the end? The Lagrangian function will be t over 2 then from the integral of from 0 to L we will generally get uh, a factor of L as we will see. So the first term will come from the square of a naught dot and there's nothing to simplify here. So this is just a, considering the integral over space, this is just a constant being integrated. So this will just be multiplied by uh, the period L. So we simply have a naught dot squared times L. That's the first term. Plus, so all the mixed terms between that come from the square, uh, square between um, a naught dot and these cosine and sine terms will all vanish because um, all of these cosines and sines are then integrated over the over all of space. They have an integer number of complete uh, wave periods over space and so they um, completely average out to zero. So none of the mixed terms here contribute. So the next term that we get is the square of these kinds of terms. So we get a sum and normally you would expect to get a double sum from squaring this expression but again, it will turn out that the mixed terms between different k values will all average out to zero in the spatial integral. So we get a sum just over a single k going over the natural numbers. And um, here we get the integral over a cosine squared over all of space over an integer number of periods. And this is just one half uh, the length that we are integrating. So in addition to the factor L, we will get here a factor of one half. And then we get the, the square of A cos K of T dot. So this squared. The cosine squared just integrates to this one half. So exactly the same argument can be made for the sine terms. So here we get a sine k of t dot squared. And again, all the mixed terms, so both the, the mixed term between the sine and the co cosine terms will vanish, and also the mixed terms between different values of k for sine vanish, so only the sine squared of the same uh, k value will integrate to one half. Okay, so uh, let's. So we have everything that comes from squaring the time derivative and then integrating it over all of space. Now let's look at what we get from the squared space derivative integrated over all of space. So first we get a minus sign. And again we can make uh, the same arguments that only the 
are squares of terms with the same function and the same k survive the spatial integral. So let's square this. We get k over 2 pi, uh, k times 2 pi over l squared times a cosine k of t squared. So the square of the sine again integrating to one half minus, so minus sine from here. Also k times 2 pi over l squared a sine k of t squared cosine integrating to one half. And that's it. Everything else averages out to zero in the spatial integration. If you want to check this calculation carefully, here's a collection of all the formulae we used implicitly in our arguments. It may also be helpful to plot some of these functions. For example, here I have plotted the product of cosine of 1x times cosine of 2x over a period of 2 pi. And you can see that there is a kind of symmetry that causes the positive and negative contributions to cancel over the full period. In contrast, when we square cosine of 2x, for example, we get a function that clearly averages to one half over the full period. Let's look at our result more closely. I have copied our result here with a slight rearrangement of terms to make things more easy to see. So we found that the action of one free boson is the time integral over the Lagrangian function with the Lagrangian function being defined as follows. And we can find a great simplicity in this expression in that it is a sum, a countably infinite sum over terms that do not at all mix with each other. So we can write our Lagrangian function conceptually as a sum over the modes of the field with a separate term contributing for each mode. And these terms for the modes are defined as follows. So we have one term for the case of the zero mode, that is TL over 2 a zero dot squared. And in the other cases, we have a term that looks like TL over four A dot K of T, this being either for the cosine or for the sine case squared minus TL over 4 K times 2 pi over L squared A cosine or sine respectively of T squared. Apart from the somewhat messy constant factors here, this result is indeed remarkably simple. First, each of the uppercase a quantities and its time derivative appear in at most one of these terms. Physically, this means that all the separate modes of the field behave as if they were completely separate physical systems, not interacting with each 
with each other at all. Also, when we look at the individual Lagrangian function for each of the modes, they are very simple, having only the time derivative squared and at most the Fourier coefficient itself squared. This will translate to a very simple behavior with time for each mode. Okay, so let's derive the equations of motion for our new variables and solve them so that we can finally see some oscillations. Since the new variables are not fields but ordinary dynamical variables, we will only need the little sister of the Euler-Lagrange equation that we used before, namely Lagrange's equation of the second kind. Uh, it says that for any variable q that appears in the Lagrangian, we can derive an equation of motion like this. The time derivative d by dt of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian function by the time derivative of q, the, the variable that we are looking at, is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian function with respect to q. Again, this notation simply means that for the purposes of this derivative, the time derivatives are simply treated as additional independent variables that the Lagrangian function is allowed to depend on. Um, actually, this partial derivative here in parenthesis has a special name. It is called the momentum conjugate to the variable q. And we will need these conjugate momenta later for all our variables. So let's calculate them once and for all for our three modes. The momentum conjugate to a0 uh, will be, uh, let's call it uppercase pi0. This will be the partial derivative of the Lagrangian function with respect to a0 dot. And that is tl times a0 dot. The conjugate momentum for our kth mode of the cosine modes will be the partial derivative of the Lagrangian function with respect to a k cosine dot and that is tl over 2 if we combine the 2 from the exponent with the 4 here times a k cosine dot t and exactly in the same way we will get it for the sine modes. I just copied over the conjugate momenta to make some space. So let's write down the equations of motion following this pattern. For the zero mode, uh, the time derivative of the conjugate momentum is tl times the second time derivative that we will denote by a double dot of a naught. And this is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian func function with uh, respect to a naught. And that is zero. As we can see, function does not depend directly on a naught. So a very simple equation here. Um, for the cosine modes, 
we get that TL over 2 times second time derivative of AK for cosine. Is equal to and here we get a partial derivative by a k cosine so overall we get minus then t l over 2 if we factor in the exponential from the square we get this factor here k times 2 pi over l squared and then from the derivative here we get 1 a k for cosine times t. This is the equation of motion for one of the cosine modes we can immediately simplify the equation somewhat by cleaning up the constants. So these non-zero constants can just be cancelled. Same here, the TL over 2 on both sides can be divided out. And to complete things, we have exactly the same form of equation for the sine modes. These are the equation, equations of motion for our Fourier modes uppercase A. Now we are in really great shape because these simple equations have very well known solutions. And in fact, if you have ever had a physics course before, you have probably seen both of them already. For the zero mode, we have the equation that is called the equation of free linear motion. Basically, it just says that the acceleration is zero, so remaining motion must, must be linear. Uh, for the non-zero modes, these are just the equation of motion of the harmonic oscillator. So here we have harmonic oscillator equations. with an angular frequency, so this is omega squared, the angular frequency squared, so we can write that the angular frequency omega for each mode is simply k times 2 pi over L. What we have just derived is a truly fundamental result in field theory. We have seen that a free field is equivalent to an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators. The harmonic oscillators having angular frequencies that depend on the wave number of the modes. We can say this with the possible exception of the zero mode. However, you see that also the equation for the zero mode can be regarded as the limit case of one of these equations when the angular frequency omega of the oscillator goes to zero. As we already came to expect from the independent terms in the Lagrangian function, these equations of motion are completely independent from each other. The modes are not coupled at all. Each of them behaves as a separate harmonic oscillator, completely independent from the rest of the system. Let's write down the general solutions to these equations of motion. As all of these equations are second order ordinary differential equations, we will have two independent constants of integration in each general solution. For the zero mode, we can write that A naught of T will be a constant constant 
a naught one plus another constant a naught two times t. The constant function and t being two independent particular solutions to this equation. For the cosine modes, we get that a cosine k of t will be one constant of integration. Let's call it a cosine k1 times cosine of kt 2 pi over l plus another constant of integration which we will call a cosine k2 times sine of kt 2 pi over l. Let me just fix this here to write this more clearly. And exactly the same for the sine modes. These constants of integration will be fixed by giving initial conditions for the field modes. And just as you recall that we had two periodic functions as initial conditions for the field, we have here now two sets of coefficients. And to give you an example of how these modes of oscillation look like, let's look at some initial conditions that only set a cosine for the mode k equals 1 to a non-zero value and we will get something that looks a bit like this. So you see it is the first cosine mode and it is oscillating in time uh, with in this case quite a low frequency. If we look at the second cosine mode would look something like this. Notice that both the spatial and the temporal frequency are doubled. The third cosine mode would look like this and so on. So um, for completeness let's also look at the first sine mode would look like this wave-like oscillation and the solutions with a sine function of time will look exactly the same just phase shifted in time by 90 degrees compared to the cosine solutions. In a general case any number of these constants of integration can be non-zero and the behavior of the solution can look quite complicated but it is really just a linear superposition of these very simple modes of oscillation that we have looked at earlier. Let's not forget to look at the zero mode. Recall that the zero mode A0 of our field is defined as the average value of the field over space. In the case of our field the zero mode does not oscillate periodically with time. Rather it looks something like this. The average value drifts uniformly with time at a constant rate. To summarize, we have seen how our field can be expanded as a Fourier series. We have now a full understanding of how the Fourier modes behave as dynamical variables in the framework of classical physics. But that's not all that we ultimately want to do. We want to proceed to the quantum mechanical description of the field and we want to arrive at the algebra of modes that Michael has presented in his video. In order to do that it will be useful to go to a more sophisticated definition of field modes using complex numbers. But let's look at that next time. If you like this video, please comment and subscribe.
If you have any questions about the video, just put them in the comments and I will answer them. See you next time.